All right, Biology 11. The next part of our internal systems unit is going to focus on the digestive system. There's going to be two YouTube lectures that are, are part of this. It's a, it's a fairly large system, lots of parts. So we'll do the first half today. We'll do the second half tomorrow. Um, going back to kind of the, the central theme of the unit, um, it's all about energy. And our cellular energy is ATP. All right. So the three units that we're going into detail in, the digestive, respiratory, and circulatory units, all center around the process of making energy, ATP, for the cell. So if we remember from yesterday's talk of nutrition, we've got various types of fuels. Now we said sugar was the number one fuel, glucose specifically. But fuels enter our cells along with oxygen. And the mitochondria turns the fuel and oxygen into ATP. How those fuels get from our intestines and the oxygen gets from our lungs to all of our cells is the job of the circulatory system. So those are the big three in terms of energy production. Digest is putting the fuel in the blood, respiratory system is putting the oxygen into the blood, and then the circulatory system distributes that blood throughout the body so the cells can have access to the fuel and the oxygen they need to make ATP. Once the fuel and oxygen are in this cell, the mitochondria on the powerhouse of the cell is the one that makes ATP, hence it being the powerhouse of the cell. Now, before we get into the digestive system, um, yesterday's talk in nutrition, one thing I forgot to do at the very end was, and I always do this, if you know somebody, if you remember yesterday we talked about anorexia and bulimia, if you know somebody that could be struggling or you yourself are struggling with an eating disorder or think you could have one, here are three places close by to the Pickering area that deal specifically with eating disorders. All right? The great majority of my students do not have a problem with this, but over the years, there are some that do struggle with this. And so there is help available. So those places will definitely provide great care for you or someone you know. All right. Also, I put this diagram up on our EDSB page today, the Human Digestive System. I am going to label this diagram after tomorrow's lecture on the accessory organs because we've got our digestive system organs here as well as some that are called accessory organs of digestion, which is a separate talk. So I'll be labeling that. Print that off if you can. If not, at least store it to your computer, to your electronic files. So the digestive system. Again, the same format as usual, our on online lecture notes that you get from your D2L page for the course up here on the iPad in the corner. And then of course, various things will be written here for you to um, add to your notes if you, if you want to. The job of the digestive system, what it does is it takes the foods that we eat and it basically breaks them down, all right? And what it forms are nutrients. Now you remember from yesterday, nutrients are the good things in food, the stuff that we can use, right? And it breaks them down into a small enough size so that they can enter the bloodstream and then enter our cells. If you think about an apple, like we've got on the background of our PowerPoint today, an apple is much, much larger than our cells. There's stuff in the apple I want to get into my cell, so I have to break down that apple. I've got to break down the food into those small, small little molecules called nutrients that can then be put in my blood and circulate it so they can reach all of the cells in my body and interact with the mitochondria and help me make energy. Anyway, so food's broken up into smaller pieces by two means. How do we do the breakdown? Well, there's mechanical digestion, and then there's chemical digestion. Mechanical digestion uses muscular action at some point to break down the food. So a physical force is applied on the food. An easy example of that, chewing. When you chew the food, your tongue and your teeth, right, are physically breaking down that food, mashing it down to a much smaller pieces, right? Chemical digestion involves the use of chemicals like enzymes. We have a variety of enzymes that 
are made in our body that basically attach to these food molecules and break them down further into smaller pieces. And remember, enzymes are a type of protein, right? Enzymes are protein molecules. Very important job in our body. So if we look at the digestive system overall, it's actually a muscular tube, right? It has two openings. One is at the oral cavity and, well, the other one, I think you know where that's at. It's the anus, right? So anyway, the muscle in this tube, it can be longitudinal or circular. And I'll show you what I mean by both of those. So if I just take a tube, say like a paper towel tube. So this could be our esophagus, the food tube, or part of our intestine or a section of our stomach or whatever. Circular muscle wraps and bands around the tube. So this is circular muscle. Longitudinal muscle, it runs down the entire length. So longitudinal muscle bands run down the length of the tube like this. All right? So this is longitudinal, and this is circular. Circular would go around the paper towel tube. Longitudinal will travel the distance of the paper towel tube. All right? We have both of these, they overlap each other. So it's not like you get this or you get this, you have both. We all have both of these running the length of the tube and around the tube, the entire digestive system, starting from our esophagus at the back of our throats, right down through to get to the rectum and anus. So muscular um, contractions push food through. We have longitudinal muscle and circular muscle, all right? The tube forms the digestive tract, or some readings you'll find out there, it'll be the alimentary canal. So if they talk about the alimentary canal, it is the same thing as your digestive system tube. It's that tube that the food travels through. <clears throat> Excuse me. So digestion is a four-step process, all right? The first step is ingestion. That's actually acquiring the food and putting it into your mouth, right? So ingestion is just a fancy way of saying eating the food. Then there's digestion. Digestion is the breakdown, right? So you're taking that bite of an apple or a piece of steak or a, whatever it happens to be and you're breaking it down physically using muscular action or chemically using enzymes. The third step is absorption. Once we have broken down the food into small enough pieces that they can now travel through the blood and get into the cell safely, we absorb those nutrients through the wall of the intestine and into the blood. The intestine has a whole bunch of blood vessels that line it, so those nutrients, the small little molecules, can now pass through the wall of the intestine and into the blood, and that's called absorption. And then there's elimination. Inside of our food, there are unused parts of it that we either can't digest or we don't want in our body. So we compact this and mix it with water and it's known as feces or, or poop. So elimination is getting rid of that stuff that we can't digest or do not want in our body. So what we're gonna do now is we're gonna go through, step by step through the digestive system and look at each of the parts and their functions, all right? So the first thing, I guess, obviously is the mouth or oral cavity. Oral cavity is Fancy word for mouth. And this is where the food enters the body. You chew it up, the tongue repositions the food on the teeth, right? Every so often the tongue isn't quick enough at getting out of the way and you bite your tongue. And then the teeth tear, cut, crush the food into pieces that form a ball-like mass called a bolus, right? And this is that mush that you end up swallowing. Um, your tongue, as I said, repositions the food so your teeth can continue to grind it down Chemically, because the mouth is mainly a mechanical or, or, or muscular part as far as the breakdown, but there are chemicals like saliva and mucus, um, and what they do is they lubricate the food. So it's a very slick material like oil, and it allows the food to slide through that tube a lot easier. You don't want it getting caught or lodging in there because then there's health problems associated with that. 
We have four types of teeth in our mouth, right? The teeth are very important organs. <clears throat> and so if we look and we start at the very front of our teeth, our, our buck teeth or our beaver teeth, those are called incisors. They have a very, if you take your thumb and you touch the bottom of them, they have a very thin edge. So this is a side view of the incisors, right? So there's the front of the teeth. These are the buck teeth. So there's the front and it's a very sharp edge right here. And then the teeth gets, tooth gets thicker as you go back, right? So this is a side view. So there's that cutting edge, right? And if you look at the word, the etymology of the word, incisors is very much like scissors. It means to cut, right? And then beside them, we have our canine teeth. Right? The ones, the fangs, ours aren't quite fangs anymore, but the ones that are like the vampire teeth or the fangs on a wolf or a dog, right? And then we have the premolars and the molars. Now, the premolars and molars are much more squared and kind of this roundish squared shape. And what they do is they grind and crush the food. So the incisors are for cutting. The canines are for tearing. Think about a, a piece of taffy. You would, you know, you wouldn't bite it through the front of your mouth. It's off to the side of your mouth, so that those canines can pierce it and rip it apart. And then further back, we've got the premolars and the molars, and these have larger surface area on top that are great for crushing that food. Right? Think of a car compactor at a junkyard. They're very much the same. Just large plates coming together and grinding that car into, you know, a paste almost. That's what this does with our food. So once we chew the food and we're satisfied that it's been broken down into that paste-like mass called the bolus, we have to swallow the food. And so from our mouth or oral cavity, the food then goes to the pharynx. Now, in class, I usually call this the pharynx. The reason I call it the pharynx is not because I don't know how it's pronounced, but students often spell it wrong. So it looks like pharynx. It's actually pronounced pharynx. Like, don't play dirty, play fair at the rinks. Fair rinks, right? So the pharynx, and this is basically the intersection at the back of your throat, right? And what I mean by an intersection is, well, if you think about an intersection in traffic, it's where four roads meet. So this is our intersection. That's our pharynx. All right. <clears throat> Excuse me. And what meets there is the oral cavity, the nasal cavity, so your nose and your mouth. And then we have the trachea, which is for air. It's the air tube and the esophagus, which is for food, all right? All four of these tubes meet at the pharynx, which is basically the back of your throat. Now, you're thinking, okay, these tubes both go downward. I drew it like a street intersection, but if I had a more accurate picture, it would kind of look like this. Well, I can show you in a, in a diagram that's coming up, but there's the nasal cavity, there's the oral cavity there, this would be your pharynx, so this is the oral cavity, nasal cavity, and then we've got the two tubes right here. All right, now I'm gonna put in blue the trachea. This is your trachea. We do not want food going down there. The trachea is for air, and if food goes down there and gets blocked, then we are in big trouble, all right? So I'm gonna move this P because I'm gonna write in there. So this area here, this is our pharynx here. This other tube at the back is the esophagus and that's for food, all right? Now, when food comes in, all right? Here's our mouth, our oral cavity, food would come in here. We don't want it to go down here into the lungs. That'll cause us to potentially choke and die. So what we have is a little flap that's right here at the back. It's a little flap of tissue called the epiglottis. I'll draw that in there neatly again. So this 
is the epiglottis. And what that little flap does is when food comes down through the mouth, it hits this flap and that flap does this. I'll use the marker here. It bends down and covers over the top of this tube. So as food comes in, this will bend down and it covers over that so the food will drop into the esophagus. All right, so this little flap right here has like a little hinge and it just it covers over the top of that. And when that's covered over, no food will get into the lungs or to the trachea and you won't choke. All right. So the epiglottis is a safety measure that keeps our airway from getting blocked by food. And it's found in the pharynx as well. And it folds over the top of the trachea. It's explained in the note there, just like I explained it here at the diagram. And so here's a picture of it here. So again, here's our oral cavity. Here's our nasal cavity here. Here's our trachea. The air tube is the one in front, right? You have two tubes in your neck. The air tube, the trachea is the one in front. Here's our esophagus, the darker tube in behind. And so when food comes in, you can see right here, this is the epiglottis in the diagram. And food would come in, hit that epiglottis, it would bend down like this, and it would cover over the trachea, which is right here. All right. Once food gets through the pharynx, it goes into the esophagus. And this is where the real muscular tube with the circular and longitudinal muscle begins. So from the pharynx, we go to the esophagus. Now I call it esophagus so people will spell it properly. It is esophagus, just like pharynx is pharynx. This is esophagus, but I call it esophagus because then people remember it. And I'll show you an even better one as we get into the lecture here. So this is our food pipe. All right, we have a windpipe and a food pipe. This is the food pipe. This is how food gets deeper down into our stomach and stuff like this. The esophagus actually meets up with our stomach. So the esophagus is about a foot long, right? It goes from the base of your ribs up to the back of your throat. And basically it's just a muscular tube. The type of muscle is smooth muscle, which makes up that circular and longitudinal muscle we mentioned before. Smooth muscle is an automatic muscle right? It's involuntary. And what that means is that if something is involuntary, it means you are not in control of it. Your body has said, you know what? This is very important. I'm going to look after this because you're a train wreck and I don't trust you. So smooth muscle, which makes up the esophagus, it makes up the stomach, the intestines, the rectum, it is involuntary. The brain looks after that. It says, look, you, you can do a lot of stuff, but this job's too important. And that's why once you swallow food, you no longer have to think, okay, food, go down through my chest, into the stomach, okay, slosh around in the acid. You don't have to do any of that. The body takes over. It's involuntary. It's automatic. You don't have to think about it. All right? So that circular and longitudinal muscle, those are types of smooth muscle that our body looks after all together. Now, the rhythmic contraction of waves that push the food through the entire tube, that is our digestive system, that's called peristalsis. Peristalsis is rhythmic contractions of smooth muscle that push the food through our digestive system. The definition is here. And it's part of mechanical digestion. So again, peristalsis, the rhythmic contraction of smooth muscle that pushes food throughout the tube that makes up your digestive system. Now, after the esophagus, we get down into the stomach. And if we were in class, I would be calling the stomach the stomach. All right, if you look at it, stomach, it looks like stomach, and everyone thinks, sir, it's stomach. The reason I do this again, this is the best example here. I once had a student write stomach like this, and I kid you not here, that is how they wrote stomach, grade 11. And I was like, oh man, 
That's that's an issue. So that's why I say fairy nix. That's why I say esophagus. That's why I say stomach. Because if you say stomach, if it gets in your head, you'll remember how to spell it. Not this. This is craziness. All right. So S T U M M I C K stomach. It, it phonetically it's right, but it's so wrong. <laughs> anyway, the stomach. It's a J-shaped organ, and uh, it holds the food. Um, food usually is in there for a couple of hours, a few hours, and it contains hydrochloric acid and some enzymes. Now, hydrochloric acid, that breaks down all types of food molecules, right? Acid just breaks down organic matter big time. And the HCL that is in our stomach, the hydrochloric acid, it's very, very strong. If you took it out of someone's stomach and purified it, its pH would be right around 1, maybe even a little bit lower. And that's a very, very strong acid if you remember the pH scale from grade 10. And there's also some enzymes in there as well. And the enzymes, again, help break down food via chemical digestion. Um, how does the stomach protect itself from its own acid? And I'll put that over here. So the stomach, the stomach has HCl inside of it. How does it protect itself from the HCl, right? Well, one of the things is it has cells that produce mucus. And mucus, it lines the inside of the stomach. It's like that slick material, right? Like that's found in spit, it's the same material. And so the mucus lines the stomach. And it's basically perpetually made, which means it's always being made. And so as long as that mucus layers on the inner wall of our stomach, the acid doesn't get a chance to get to the muscle, right? Because we know it's smooth muscle that makes up the stomach and then you don't end up with a hole in your stomach. When you end up with that hole in your stomach, it is an ulcer and they're very, very painful. Then that acid can leak out onto other organs and start to break them down as well. So incredibly painful ulcers can be. Mucus being continually replaced on the inner wall help defend against that. We also have sphincters. Now our stomach is a J-shaped organ, so I'm going to try to draw one here. Um, it kind of looks like this, I guess, like that. Now, at the top of the stomach, we've got a sphincter, and we've got another one here at the base of the stomach. So there's our stomach. I try to draw it in a letter J like that, if you think about it, there's a J. This one up here is the cardiac or esophageal sphincter. Esophageal sphincter. This one down here is the pyloric sphincter. All right. Now, we've all done this. What's a sphincter actually look like? Well, it's a muscular ring, but it's usually part of a tube and it restricts flow of substances through that tube. So think about having your hood on, right? You're wearing a hoodie and you probably are, you know, you've done this as a kid. You take the two drawstrings and you pull them tight. And what happens is the hood starts to close in front of your face. The next thing you know, you're looking out through that little tiny opening. That's what a sphincter is like. It's a muscular drawstring that can be pulled really, really tightly so that none of this acid-soaked food that's in your stomach can leak out or move upward, right? Connected here, we have the small intestine and connected up here, we have the esophagus. The small intestine and the esophagus that connect to the stomach, they're not capable of defending against that acid. If acid gets on their inner walls, it's going to hurt them right? And so to, what happens is to limit that, we have these muscular sphincters which draw very, very tightly. It's like pulling the lace on the hoodie very, very tight so that very little of that stomach acid can escape the stomach and, and burn these other organs, all right? So that's one protection. That's two protections. There is a third that I will mention shortly. So the muscular uh, wall of the stomach, again, being muscle and being involuntary smooth muscle, which means not in your control, it ha happens automatically, 
the stomach gently churns. It's like the washing machine when it starts. It kind of rocks back and forth a little bit. And what that does, just like the washing machine agitates and throws around the clothes so that the soap can get access to it, it's the same thing in here. The stomach churns, and this tosses around the food a little bit so that it can be exposed, more of the surface area of the food can be exposed to the stomach acid. And that's a good thing because then it breaks down the food quicker and more of the food gets broken down. We don't want large chunks of food getting into the, you know, the uh, small intestine, the next part. So we look at it here. Here's a stomach much nicer than mine. And here we can see the esophageal sphincter here at the top. And we see the pyloric sphincter at the base. And there's that J shape that we are aware of. I don't know why I drew it. This is, this is a much better diagram. And so we see here, here's your stomach here. It's got a highly folded interior, right? Think like an accordion. The accordion, I can squeeze the accordion together or I can expand it because of that folded part in the middle of the accordion. That's what these folds are like. So if you eat a lot, your stomach can actually expand a bit to facilitate more food coming in, right? So it's not like a rigid organ where if you put too much in, the stomach ruptures or, or, or it breaks it can expand to a point. Now, if you just continuously eat, your stomach could rupture. But we have nerve cells that are built into the wall of the stomach that send a signal up to our brain saying, you're full. So whenever you feel full or sated, it's nerve endings in the stomach wall that do that. They send that signal up because these folds have expanded and triggered the nerve to say, you know what, there's a lot of food in here. We're pretty good now. Let's get away from the table, right? There's actually a genetic disorder called Prader-Willi syndrome. And in Prader-Willi syndrome, um, those nerve endings don't fire up to the brain. So a lot of kids that have Prader-Willi syndrome are obese because they're not, they're, their body isn't telling them you're full. And so they still feel kind of hungry and they overeat and then they don't burn off those calories and weight is gained on the body. So it's a genetic thing, an, an, an odd genetic disorder. From the stomach, we go to the small intestine. Keep our arrow diagram here. The next thing we go to, oh, small intestine, small intestine. And I'm going to put underneath it here, D, J, I. All right. So from the stomach, we pass through the pyloric sphincter into the small intestine, all right? The small intestine is actually very, very long, right? Um, the small intestine can be anywhere from 21 to 24 feet long um, in an adult. So it's not named small intestine because of its length, it's its diameter. Its diameter is basically 2.5 centimeters. If you remember, here's, here's my tube. Diameter runs right through the middle of the tube. So this is 2.5 centimeters. That's why this is called the small intestine, because that diameter is so small. The large intestine has a much larger diameter. It's a larger tube, so that's why it's called the large intestine versus this one. So that's an inch, 2.5 centimeters. That's the basic, the average diameter of the small intestine. The small intestine has three sections. The duodenum, or duodenum, or duodenum. I've heard all three from different professors and teachers. All three are acceptable. It's like tomato, tomato, right? I still know what you're talking about. So duodenum, here it is here. Duodenum or duodenum, all right? So we have the duodenum, and this is them in order. Then the jejunum and the ileum, all right? So these three sections make up our small intestine, and they are in that order. So from the stomach, we enter the food enters from the stomach into the duodenum, then it travels into the jejunum, and then finally the last part of the small intestine is the ileum, the eye part of this. All right? So by the time we get partially through the duodenum, digestion is completed. We add extra enzymes in there, more chemical digestion, more of the food breaking down, and digestion is now complete by the time we get to the end of the duodenum. All right? So we've ingested, and then through these organs here, we've digested, and the mouth has some digestion too, physical, right? But we've digested, and now in these last two parts here, we are gonna run absorption, that's the third step. 
Remember, ingestion was first, digestion was second, and then absorption. Absorption happens right here in these areas. The jejunum and ileum. So after food is broken down entirely by the enzymes of the muscular action, we're going to go through absorption. Now, absorption happens in the small intestine um, as it scrapes along the 21 to 24 feet of it, 6 to 7 meters. If I take a picture of the small intestine, the inside of the small intestine, what it actually looks like is not this. There's a tube. Could that be the small intestine? Well, yeah, it's a tube, right? But it's not what the small intestine looks like on the inside. If I take a section of your small intestine, it actually looks like this. So I'll kind of make my tube here first. And on the inside, there's a whole bunch of finger-like projections. Now, what this does, this expands the surface area on the inside of the small intestine. So here's my small intestine. And these finger-like projections are called the villi. So the villi are these things, the fingers, right? There's a villi or villus, right? Villus is singular, villi plural. There's a villus right there. So we've got millions of these inside of our small intestine. They're very, very small. Tons of them. And basically what that does, think about these two tubes. They're roughly the same length. Now, if I look at this line, it is that long, right? So what is that? That looks like it might be about 6 inches, 15 centimeters, whatever. This line is a little bit longer, but if I actually were to make that into a straight line and all those ridges expanded, it would be much longer. So it increases the length inside of there. It increases that surface area. And we want to maximize surface area because the more surface area we have for absorption, that means we can take in more nutrients. Right? The nutrients can come inside because we've increased surface area. It goes up, and that allows us to absorb more nutrients. So this tube, yeah, we'd get some absorption of the small intestines like that, but because it's like this, the food basically drags along a lot longer line of tube and much more of the, many more of the nutrients can be absorbed into the body. Now you're thinking, okay, well, what if something dropped on the ground and of course nobody was looking and I picked it up and I ate it, right? Well, our villi look after us there too. If we look at the villi here, we see the two things that are inside that are very important. So I'm taking one of these little finger-like projections and blowing it up right here in this picture. First of all, for the absorption, right? The absorption, I have blood vessels inside of here, little capillaries. And so a nutrient would come, hit the villi, pass through its wall, into the capillary here, and now it's into the blood vessels here and can travel around our body and be delivered to cells. So that looks after the absorption. Right, because we know the inner wall of the small intestine absorbs nutrients, puts it into the blood. Well, it makes sense that the villi, which make up the inner wall of the intestine, have blood vessels traveling through them. Now, there's this other thing in here called the lacteal. The lacteal has a high concentration of white blood cells. Right, and the easy way to remember that is the sugar in milk is called lactose. Right, that's the sugar in milk, and a lacteal has white blood cells inside of it. Right, so it's a high concentration of white blood cells. We'll just think white like milk is white. Right, so a lacteal has white blood cells, and we know that these things are part of our immune system. They fight off foreign pathogens that are going to try to get inside of our body and take it over, cause disease, or kill us. So if we happen to eat a french fry that fell to the ground when no one was looking, we picked it up and snuck it back in our mouths and ate it, if there happened to be any bacteria here and they get through the acid of the stomach, a lot of things get killed by the acid of the stomach, if they even were absorbed here, the lacteal would introduce them to a whole bunch of white blood cells, which would then attack them All right, as part of our immune response.
So we can see here, here's a picture of our large, or sorry, our small intestine. This is the small intestine. And we can see the inner folds here. We can see all the villi, right? These are right, my villi here. And they're all clustered together. And what scientists have found now is that even on the villi, so if we look at a villi here is a microscopic picture of the villi, on the outer surface of the villi, there are microvilli, which means the small little finger-like projections on the inside of our small intestine are covered in even smaller numerous finger-like projections called microvilli. So we really boost the surface area and maximize our absorption of nutrients. So now the good stuff, the nutrients are inside of us. And like we said before, there's only one job left and that's elimination. We've absorbed or drawn in the good stuff. Now we gotta get rid of the bad stuff or the stuff that's just, we're unable to digest. Like the cellulose in the cell uh, walls of grass or, or plants. We can't break that down. It just passes right through us, becomes part of poop. So from the small intestine, we go to the large intestine. The large intestine or colon, sometimes it's called the colon, but if you have, uh, if you mention the colon or large intestine, it's the same thing. And it has an awesome job. Um, it takes the indigestible material that you don't break down or that you didn't want to break down and mixes it with water and forms poop, feces, right? Pretty crappy job. Ha ha ha, get it? Crappy. Anyway, um, so the large intestine or colon has basically four little sections to it and i'll show you in the diagram up here it connects to the small intestine at something called the ileal that is bad we'll try that again ileal cecal valve A valve is a one-way doorway. So here's our small intestine here, and the indigestible material be moving this section. Here's our large intestine here, again, the larger diameter. So food would come through here, and here's our ileocecal valve. It looks like this. It looks like a pair of saloon doors that were bent, and they're too big to close over like normal saloon doors. And so what happens is the indigestible material, the stuff that's going to form our feces or poo, it comes into here. So once it's in here, if it tries to go back up through there, it can't. These two little bent areas, they are basically almost touching. And so stuff can push their way down through because they're curved downward. So stuff can come down and pass through them pretty easily. It can't go back up. So whenever you see a valve, it's a one-way doorway. All right, food can travel down through the valve from the small intestine to the large intestine, and that's the way we want to go, small to large. But it can't, once it's in the large intestine, it can't go back up. These two things would, you know, connect back together. All right, so if it tried to push up through there, these two little parts would touch and not allow it to go backwards. Our heart also has valves in it that control blood flow, make sure it only travels with the heart in one direction. It's a one-way doorway. Anyway, the large intestine has different sections. We'll show you them on the diagram. Um, and then at the base of the small intestine, at the, or sorry, at the base or end of the large intestine, we have the rectum and the anus. Um, whenever I teach organs to the grade 10s, I always try to characterize um, all the different organs, right? So the brain is the smartest organ, the heart is the hardest work, and the skin is the most underrated. I think the rectum has the worst job in the entire body, right? Basically what the rectum does is as feces are being produced all the time in your body, well, you can't release them all the time, right? You can't, can't constantly be pooping your pants. So what the rectum does is as feces are made, fecal matter is made, it compacts it into a log or a, a poop until you're ready to go. And it just sits there. So you can that's just not a cool job as far as, you know, I'm concerned. I'd rather be the heart or muscles or something else, not the rectum. But anyway, 
And then the anus is another sphincter, a muscular drawstring. And what it does, when it, that you know, mass of feces is large enough, the brain sends down a, uh, an impulse to the anus and says, you get that feeling like it's time to go to the bathroom. And then the anus will open up and the feces will be removed from your body. So we look here. This is where the small intestine meets up with the large intestine. And it's down here on the lower right side of your body. All right, the lower right side of your body. And we can see the small intestine here. Here's our large intestine here. And look at this, this is our appendix. Now the appendix is not one of our organs of digestion. It doesn't do anything. If you remember evolution, it's, an, it's a vestigial organ. Something that in our evolutionary history we, we may have used. Biological sci um, evolutionary biologists believe that the appendix used to be used for digesting grasses and cell wall material like cellulose. But we don't eat that anymore, our diet has changed, so the organ has regressed into this little sort of flappy thing here. And it's found at the base of the large intestine. Now if it becomes infected with bacteria and starts to fester, it's called appendicitis, right? Itis means inflammation and swelling of. So appendicitis is inflammation and swelling of the appendix. And so even though it can't do anything for us, it could actually kill us. If appendicitis occurs and the appendix starts to swell and fill up with bad bacteria and it ruptures, those bacteria now are released into the abdominal cavity and can attack other organs and that can bring about our death. Here's the overall, so it shows here in the body where it's at. So the small intestine is actually wrapped in the middle here and food would go through the ascending colon. Ascending means to go up. Transverse means to cross. Descending means to come down. And the sigmoid colon gets it centered back into the center of the body where the rectum is. And we see the rectum here. Again, it has folds like the stomach does in a way because it has to expand as more fecal matter comes into it. And then the anus would be at the end here. So food just doesn't go right from the base of the small intestine and outer body. It actually goes up the ascending colon, across the transverse colon, down the descending colon and gets recentered by the sigmoid colon and then it's stored, the feces are stored in the rectum. And I found this, speaking of food, I found this, um, this meme somebody had generated here and there's a pizza and somebody cut a triangle out of the middle of the pizza and then of course that famous line from um, the dark night, some men want to see the world burn. Um, if someone did that to my pizza, I, I would I would find them um, and I would <laughs> I can't believe someone would do that anyway better not do that to my pizza that's it for now there will be more tomorrow second part of the digestive system have your diagram ready for tomorrow and uh, that's it so if there's any questions comments or concerns throw them in the comments section underneath this video or Go to the Edsby page for the class if you're one of my students and fire off your questions there. Oh, one last thing to complete our diagram down here. Large intestine. Rectum. Anus. So we've gone through the whole gambit here. This is the order that food travels through our digestive system. All right. Again, any questions, comments, or concerns, there's no question too big or too small. Please ask. Be in the know. You can't just sit there and not know. I'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye.